The unofficial title of my presentation is Teacher Replies to Symposium, Wonders What the Heck She'll Talk About for 20 Minutes, and proceeds to make 65 slides. Brace yourself. <laughs> I'd like to give you the context of my class. Um, I'm honored to have a colleague in the room right now who does coverage, so he might smile and nod as I describe my class. 26 students in a grade split at a school that has some income instability in our community, some housing instability, about 25 languages and cultures represented within our school. In my classroom, there are seven IEPs for students who have identified learning challenges and exceptionalities. There are many students whose challenges and exceptionalities will never be formally identified. There are two new English learners, one from Japan and one from Syria. And there are three to four students who routinely take turns rolling on the floor and making animal sounds. I say this because I'm your colleague. I don't teach in a vacuum. I'm not a demonstration classroom. And I face the same ch challenges and obstacles you do with your amazing students who are hopeful and who want to learn and who we love and care for and who are imperfect like us. So that's my point. My lens for technology is that I like things that are simple and not intimidating. I like things that won't be a fail if the Wi-Fi signal um, is unreliable at my end of the building, which it often is. Um, I like things that serve my learning agenda and are organic to my learning goals. So that's sort of my lens on technology. I have noticed that a lot of people use classroom Twitter feeds to promote learning in their classroom with the intended audience of parents. And I'm going to leave that thought for a moment. This is me on Twitter. Um, there's a pretty high profile educator named George Coras in Alberta who has one Twitter feed. He shares his cat videos, his educational blogs, his thoughts. And because he's a big enough name, those of us who follow him love to read everything he writes. That's not me. My family doesn't want to read my educational articles. My parent group doesn't want to see my cat videos necessarily. And so coming from a background as a language educator, I, I personally think a lot about purpose and audience. So my personal um, Twitter account, it's locked uh, for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to talk about on the videotaped session, but I'll tell you at the end when the cameras are off. Um, and I'm mostly a consumer on that feed. I read the news. I follow people that are interesting to me. Um, for a long time, this had been my most active feed, and this is where I, I follow people that I think are big thinkers <coughs> in education. I get ideas, I read research, I network with people, and this feeds me as a professional. And this is my class feed. And in my ideal, I always wanted, to, wanted it to be something where we connected with the world and where we posed our questions and we wondered. Nowhere in my audience list do you see parents. They're welcome as community members, but they're not a target. I already mentioned at the beginning, uh, while some of you were waiting, that I have posted, these actually were samples that I deleted, but I have posted a couple survey questions about Twitter use at this Twitter feed if you're interested in participating. I'd like to begin with a quote by Brené Brown. She's a pretty favorite voice for a lot of people currently. If you don't know Brené, she's a professor in the US who specializes on shame and vulnerability research, which has led her to talk a lot about connection and wholehearted living. And Brené says that in order for connection to happen, we have to be seen. We need to be truly, deeply seen. And I'd like you to keep that quote in mind as we look at how Twitter can be used as part of a program tool um, in our classrooms. As part of my prep work for this seminar, I did some surveying of how educators are using Twitter. Um, a lot of the responses come from either local educators from our system, or actually the United States where the Global Read Aloud is very active and has been really engaged um, with my class as a participant as well. And so in terms of teacher accounts, there's two main reasons uh, teachers are on Twitter 
uh, with their own professional account. And similar to myself, it's networking <laughs> and it's following and reading others. A huge percentage of the 152 respondents said that they do have a separate class Twitter feed that's distinct from their other personal Twitter feed or their professional one, whatever they define their own feed as being. And 70% of the respondents did say their main purpose in having a class feed is to share and promote the learning that's going on in their classroom. With 40% of them saying that their target is parents and their secondary target is other classrooms and teachers and sharing the learning going on. So I'm going to walk you through three experiences from this fall in my classroom. So fall 2016, Twitter experience number one. September 1st, a teacher from Thunder Bay posts this on Twitter. He would like people to show his class the positive impact of social media. Send us a greeting. I messaged him and said, school hasn't started. I can't send you a picture of uh, my class hiding behind books or whatever. <laughs> um, what do you want? He's like, send me a picture of you. Send your class Twitter handles. Say hi. Done. So, like we do in teaching, his good idea percolated in my mind for a little bit, and I thought, I want this for my class. Those first few weeks where I'm not totally worried about the curriculum and learning agenda, I'm building class culture and setting a tone, I would like my kids to hear messages from other people and I would like them to know that they're part of something. I want them to know you're part of this class community, but you're part of a bigger community. You are noticed, you are connected. And our audience this year is bigger than me, bigger than each other, and bigger than your moms and dads. And so, we got greetings, we got advice, we got mantras even. We heard from a lot of colleagues within the system, teachers within my building, teachers who used to teach in my building, teachers who didn't know our class at all. We heard from our member of parliament, a local farmer, our police chief. We heard from an author in Massachusetts who wrote our first read aloud that we were going to be reading. And I did totally tag these people and try to get them to respond. <laughs> because you will shamelessly pursue people on Twitter for your students in a way you never would for yourself. <laughs> sort of. Sort of. Uh, we heard from a secondary school administrator within our system, kindergarten teachers. We heard from the mayor, from a radio personality, from a digital learning support teacher who's sitting in this room, from a bank piper. And so we had invited the community in. We had, no, I had invited the community in. I had engaged some significant leaders. I had helped the students feel welcomed. But they weren't that engaged by it. They thought, that's nice. They had not been involved. I was curious why the community members cared and why they took the time. And they do have their own agenda as leaders in their organization, as politicians, as public figures. But the themes that came out were the same as ours. Connection and engagement, investment in youth, and that idea that we are a community and that there's a bigger picture. When you share the learning in your classroom, you obviously share from across the curriculum. When you're looking at Twitter as a tool for your program, for me, the language document is the natural place to go. And I looked at some of the philosophical stuff at the front that we often don't have time to look at when we're looking at our learning expectations. And I saw <coughs> themes around responsible use, expressing feelings and opinions, developing purpose and audience, interacting socially, asking questions, sharing learning, interacting, and connecting with the world. Fall Twitter experience number two. Deputy Fire Chief Rob Martin, who had not been part of that first experience, had not sent us a greeting, posts that him and the police chief and Lisa Drew and the mayor of Kitchener are doing a gratitude challenge. Every day, they are going to answer a very specific prompt 
is totally spoke to my language teacher heart. I heard writing prompt, quick write, daily write. So I say we're in, and all of a sudden we're in a group of five. The mayor, the fire chief, the police chief, the radio personality, and Mrs. Faye's class. So this was the prompts they had chosen, so we joined their vision. And most days, at the beginning of our language block, I posted a question, and my kids literally did a short excerpt. Short, because if they chose to share it with my class, with each other, then they knew that I was documenting as they shared, and that their first name, and their statement, and their explanation got to go out onto, into the Twitter world. And at the very least, we had a very significant group of four that was going to affirm and reply to their ideas. Um, Deputy Chief Martin is very big on the mental health agenda. And so he's very interested in these kinds of activities in classrooms if you're looking for connections. Um, and if you know the police chief, he is as well. So students were more engaged. This time, their name their first name went on Twitter. Their words got put on Twitter. Their ideas. And they were starting to feel noticed, seen, by significant leaders in our community. Fall Twitter experience number three, Global Read Aloud. My name is Pernille Rip. I'm the founder of the Global Read Aloud Project and a seventh grade teacher in Oregon, Wisconsin. And I transform lives through literacy. So the Global Read Aloud started in 2010 with a simple goal in mind, read a book to connect the world. And so every year it's grown from that, but the concept of it continues to be very simple. You pick a book, and then at the same time across the world, you read it aloud to your students, and you use technology to connect. There's no lesson plan. There's, you know, a very simple map to follow, but what you want to do with it is, is great. And I just sit back and say, sounds good. Go do it. This was my third year participating in Global Read Aloud. And um, I've always been nervous about Google Hangouts and Mystery Skype and all the problems that could happen. I'm unique as a control freak in teaching, I've heard. <laughs> Not. But anyways, um, so my Global Read Aloud tools involve my media card with my projector, the book, my phone, which is a data backup when the Wi-Fi signal isn't working, and my attachment that allows me to project my phone onto the big screen. And with that, my class has been able to interact and have the technology piece. I contacted Pernil because third year in, I had had a very positive experience as a participant in a slow chat my first year. The hosts um, kept up with their responsibility, posted amazing questions. We felt like we were engaged in a simple way. Last year it had fallen apart when we participated. Um, I think people signed up, they were keen in the summer, and it just felt like it didn't happen. I just messaged her on Facebook and said, is there a slow chat? She said, no, you can make it. And that's kind of her vision. So she has this massive idea, and then she gets teachers to be leaders with her and to step up and have their own vision for how it goes. And live your dream. Oh, sorry, space bar doesn't work for that. So here's her post. Yes, there is a slow chat for PACS. And there's our class with the tentative schedule. We, put, uh, we reached out on both Twitter and the Facebook page and we asked for five other classes to take one week of Global Read Aloud with us being the first class. We had many, many classes disappointed that they couldn't take a facilitation role, and we had three other teachers take our schedule and start other slow chats, one more for this book and uh, two for other books that were part of Global Read Aloud. So that's kind of cool reach that I can't really measure, but kind of neat. So, our process for the week we are, uh, oh sorry, I'm going to back it up. When I explained what would be happening to the class and that we would read our chapter, we would generate our own questions, we would post them live on Twitter, and then we'd wait and see what happened, I said, I feel really good about this. I think that we can get 50 classes around North America to follow us. 
they felt that I was very negative and not very hopeful at all. And they said 100. So that was kind of my vision and their vision. So every day, this is an example from our first day. We read the chapter, we talked about it, and I said, what are you wondering? What questions would you ask other learners? And they wrote the questions by saying it. I recorded it, we posted it live. The first day we got feedback, could you, and after you've posted all your questions, put them together in one document? Sure, I'm super tech savvy. <laughs> Type them into notes on my phone, <laughs> screenshot, post. That was my, my process. We also got feedback, would you provide questions ahead? We have a holiday, we're on a field trip. No, because I'm not writing the questions. I'm not pretending that kids are doing this. My students will share the questions after we've read the chapter. Um, and that was fine, so they could catch up next week. So for that first week of Global Read Aloud, we focused on our primary role as facilitator. Um, we did participate. It's a bit of an odd experience to answer your own questions on Twitter, but we did a little bit. But that was secondary to really understanding our role as facilitators. We got to see our tweets projected on other whiteboards, in other classrooms, in other communities, in other parts of the world. We got to read ideas and responses from other students. Because of my projection of 50, I also employed another high-tech um, tool, pen and paper, where I listed everybody that followed us. Our first interaction was with Atlanta, Georgia. And then it goes to Barrie, Waterloo, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Katy, Texas, Akron, Indiana, Dryden, Ontario, Hickory, North Carolina, Ottawa, so on. We posted pictures of the list, and we got people saying, we're number 18, we're number 23, we're number 97. And then we got, we're not on the list. And I would check their handle, there's no posts. And what I learned was that we don't always see connections. We had classes engaged with our questions, following us all week, posting on Padlet, blogging about it, talking to another class in their community about our questions. We didn't see it, but they felt connected. <laughs> so this is what it looked like at first. And then all of a sudden it evolved. Teachers stopped typing, and they started taking photos of the student writing, the student penmanship the way it looked, uncorrected, spelling mistakes, exact words from kids. Padlet came out, mini whiteboards, art, and then the instant gratification, the feedback that came. I got a five minute warning about two minutes ago, so. All about meaningful discussion and thinking and not expecting this kind of questioning and the part they didn't say at the end of their sentence was from students. So after our week ended, we had to transition out of facilitator role, and it was with some grief and loss for my class. They really did not want to pass on the torch. <laughs> but this is where my curriculum program mind came in. Why are we doing this? How can I justify all this time we're using from our language block on this novel? Um, and so we dug into some traditional reader response type things, but I love meaning making. I love the idea of how can we go deeper. And one of our biggest guiding questions that we would add to the end of the rephrased question with my answer and my reason was then, why is this likely in books? Why is this likely in stories, in life, in humans, in wildlife, amongst animals? And that's a deeper way of connecting. And sometimes we would just talk about the questions we saw on Twitter, and we would post some sample answers. Other days, we would write deep, rich answers. They weren't all this good. This is like the kind you show when you're presenting a symposium. <laughs> and they are actually all good, as I say that. It's just different. But sometimes on Google Drive, that one was through Google Classroom. I shared that graphic organizer in our notebook. Sometimes we still took the liberty of throwing out our own question, even though we weren't the host, which you're allowed to do. And 63 classes said that was okay and replied. And we had sketchbooks that were part of our reader response. I asked educators involved with it, how did you share your student work? 
And while most of them did type their student answers on Twitter, many posted photos. Pernille gave a number of over 900,000 students involved in Global Read Aloud this year when she closed the official sign-up on October 19th. But she said it's more than the number, it's about the connection between child and book, between student and student in the same classroom, and between classes in different buildings and different parts of the world. This is a quick Twitter analysis of the first week when we hosted, and then when the focus went on to the other classes. This is not of the hashtag, this is of our class handle. And still how that leadership stayed a little bit present throughout. What's super cool is this analysis tool said that our reach was something like 90,000 Twitter accounts. This is a map of everywhere that our hashtag showed up. It did not show up in the middle of North, Northern Ontario. It, the circle's off a bit, that's like Thunder Bay. But we knew we had a big following in California, Alberta, and Texas, and that showed up on the map. My reasons why I'm loving implementing uh, Twitter is the simplicity, the flexibility, the maximization of like um, broad connections, many connections, shared leadership, and I'm a big fan of things that, that you do when you can, if you can, how you can. And Pernille, the Global Read Aloud founder, had similar comments, accessibility, immediate gratification for students. So, what did educators like most about the Twitter slow chat for Global Read Aloud? Connecting was number one, and the questions was number two. My students, their favorite part of Twitter this fall was their week of hosting. If I summed up what they like about Twitter for learning, the three words would be authentic or well, there's more. Three points would be authentic purpose, audience, connection. <laughs> and they said yes and yes to continuing Twitter with both other classes and community members. These were their words and comments. All the red is connection, and all the blue is about there being others in their learning. Their only wish was that their faces and possibly videos of them talking about their reading could have been part of their experience. So connection is why we're here. It gives purpose and meaning to our lives, to our classrooms, to our students, and to our learning. And there's like someone like with a hook in the door for me. So I'm going to say thank you.